Hello, and thank you for joining us for part one of our four-part Intellectual Property Basics series. This workshop series is being presented through a collaborative partnership between the Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development Center and the UA Little Rock William H. Bowen School of Law Business Innovations Clinic. I am Brett Harris, a Rule 15 student attorney at the Bowen School of Law. And I'm Kim Vudin, Assistant Professor of Clinical Education and the Director of the Business Innovations Clinic at the Bowen School of Law. The information provided in this presentation does not and is not intended to constitute legal advice. Instead, all information, content, and materials shared in this presentation are for general informational purposes only. Information presented in this presentation may not constitute the most up-to-date legal or other information. This presentation contains links to third-party websites and materials. Such links are only for the convenience of the attendee, user, or observer. UA Little Rock does not endorse the content of third-party sites. It is hard to imagine living a single day without seeing, using, or benefiting from something protected by intellectual property law. Intellectual property is defined as any work product that results from the human mind that's legally recognized for protection from unauthorized use. You can see, based off of this broad definition, that intellectual property law encompasses and protects a lot of different things, things that we use and benefit from every day. The underlying goals of intellectual property law are to motivate authors and inventors to continue innovating and creating new things by protecting compensation for creation of their works. Within intellectual property, there are four major legal tools that are used to protect the owners of creative works. In fact, certain works can be protected by more than one of these tools. This is the very reason why it is important to have a basic understanding of each of these tools and know the potential positives and negatives associated with each. Throughout this presentation, we will be briefly examining each tool in hopes of providing a high-level, basic understanding of each. Let's start by examining the definition of each tool. Copyright protects original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Trademark protects identifying marks used in association with goods and services in commerce. Patent protects the inventions and underlying designs of technology, product formulations, and utilitarian items. Trade secrets protect certain inventions, assets, and processes created and or owned by businesses that elect to keep them secret. But first, a pop quiz. For each question, please respond true or false. You should copyright your business name. False, because business names and logos are protectable by using trademarks and, copy, and not copyrights. You should patent a new custom necklace design that features a new class that can be secured easily. True, this type of useful invention would be protectable using a utility patent. You can claim trade secret protection of a cookie recipe if you sell your cookie recipe in a cookbook. False. A trade secret cannot be commercially or publicly known beforehand. Selling the recipe would make it publicly, publicly known. Now let's start taking a closer look at each of the four major tools used in IP, starting with copyrights. Copyright protects original works of authorship that are fixed in a physical or tangible form. Specifically, this protection attempts to prevent others from using an author's work without authorization or compensation to the author. Now let's break down the definition of copyright, starting with what are works of authorship. Works of authorship are the types of works that are eligible for copyright protection. Literary works, including written works such as poems, novels, and even academic writings. Musical works include song lyrics and even underlying musical compositions. Dramatic works include plays, musicals, and other theater-type productions. 
Pantomimes and choreographic works in modern times primarily consist of recorded choreography, but still do include pantomimes, which are basically speechless performances to music. Pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works are comprised of what most would call fine arts, including paintings, photographs, and sculptures. Motion pictures and audiovisual works include works such as movies and any type of work that includes graphics and accompanying audio which are synced together. Sound recordings are basically any type of audio recording, whether it be a particular recorded song, a recorded speech, or even recordings of natural sounds. Architectural works protect certain unique and distinct architectural designs created by architects. Here, think of unique building designs such as the One World Trade Center in New York City. Next, let's examine the definition of original works. As used in copyright context, original works are created independently by a human author and possess at least some minimal degree of creativity. A minimal degree of creativity can be found in something as simple as the author's layout and arrangement of a compilation of existing works. In fact, you may be surprised to learn that compilations such as a phone book may be eligible for copyright protection because the act of selecting the layout and organizing the information meets this minimal degree of creativity threshold. Last and arguably most important, let's examine what it means to be fixed in a tangible form. In practical terms, this just means that the work must be recorded in a manner so that the author could share the exact work with others. This sharing can be done physically or electronically. Therefore, a work is considered recorded if it is shown on a piece of paper or even if it is a saved file on a hard drive or a server. The key concept from the requirement of being fixed in a tangible form is that the work has to be actually recorded and not just a mere idea in somebody's head. At this point, you may be thinking that copyrights can basically protect anything. That's not correct because there are several types of works that are commonly mistaken as being protectable when in fact they are not. Some common exam examples of such mistakes include, but are not limited to, common recipes or discoveries of existing things in nature. Here, think of an ingredient list and a basic preparation instructions accompanying it. Works that are not fixed in a tangible form. Here again, think of ideas and concepts as not being protectable. Titles, names, short phrases, and slogans. Here, think of business names or even band names. Mere variations of ornamentation, lettering, or other styling. Here, changing the font of the work or changing the styling of the content does not meet the minimal degree of creativity needed for copyright. Familiar symbols or designs. Here, you cannot protect things universally recognized such as letters, musical notation, or even common patterns like polka dots. To obtain a copyright registration, you must file an application with the United States Copyright Office. Registering copyrights with the Copyright Office is relatively inexpensive compared to other patent and trademark costs. With the assistance of an attorney, you can expect to pay anywhere from $250 to $500 or more for registration. The filing fee from the U.S. Copyright Office is in the range of $45 to $65 depending on how many owners and the type of owner of the work, and that would be your cost without the help of legal counsel. Most new copyrights are typically protected for the life of the author plus 70 years from the death of the author. After a copyright expires, the work enters what is called the public domain. Works in the public domain are free for use by anybody without compensation to the original copyright holder. Before we leave copyrights, it's time for another quick pop quiz. Are the dance move combinations depicted here protected by copyright? 
Yes, the specific choreography depicted in the graphic is protected. In fact, you may recognize the dance as being from Beyonce's Single Ladies music video. This dance is the first major commercial pop music video dance that has successfully obtained federal copyright registration. On to trademarks. A trademark is a mark that consists of words, names, symbols, devices, sounds, or any combination thereof. The ultimate goal of trademarks is to distinguish the good and service of one particular source from those of another. As such, trademarks are used as a means of indicating the origin of goods and services. In that trademarks are used to create a brand for goods and services, they're intended to serve as a means of consumer protection. Trademarks can enable consumers to easily identify their favorite brands and distinguish them from products made by others. Take for instance shopping at a supermarket. A shopper can easily identify her favorite brand of ranch dressing from a shelf containing several brands due to the distinguishability of the trademarked logo. In short, trademarks try to create brand protection by punishing free riders and copycats. Some common mistakes made in developing new marks include the use of personal names, use of generic terms which consumers use to describe the actual product, use of terms merely describing the products, including a geographically misleading reference, and developing a mark already in use by somebody else. Likelihood of confusion is an often referred to standard for measuring the degree of potential for a mark to conflict with another. This standard is based on numerous factors relating to what consumers likely will perceive. Thus, the primary question is whether consumers will be confused as to the provider of the particular good or service. To illustrate a likelihood of confusion, consider the following. Sky Cosmetics is an existing business and has a registered trademark. Let's imagine a new startup is hoping to trademark the name Sky Blush. Here, it's likely that Sky Blush cannot obtain registration because its mark is visually and phonetically similar to an existing mark and for the same type of good. Trademarks are initially granted for a 10-year term. However, you must file declarations of use between years 5 and 6 and 9 and 10 in order to maintain the registration. Trademarks are to a degree perpetual in duration so long as the actual use of the mark is continued and the proper declarations are filed. The overall cost of obtaining a trademark is relatively low compared to other IP tools such as patents. You should expect to pay anywhere from $500 to $2,000 per registration depending upon the complexity of the mark and the number of potential conflicting marks. The current USPTO filing fee is $250 to $350 for each class in which you seek protection for your mark. It's time for another pop quiz. Which of the following marks could potentially be eligible for trademark registration? A. Sweet and Creamy Gelato B. Cooper's Country Cooking C. Nine key shoes, or D, none of the above? The correct answer is D, none of the above. Choice A is incorrect because it's merely descriptive of the product itself. Choice B is incorrect because it consists of primarily a last name and likely could not prove that it's acquired distinctiveness. Choice C is incorrect because it's confusingly similar to Nike shoes. Now let's jump into patents. A patent is a type of property right issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office to inventors of new ideas or developments. Patents allow the owner to exclusively manufacture, market, 
and distribute the work, either for sale or for free for the duration of the patent, which is generally 20 years from the date of application. Patents must be new and useful inventions and or processes in order to qualify for registration. Useful means that the invention or process is operational and produces a beneficial output. New means it has not yet been patented or otherwise been used in the world with or without a patent. With respect to being new, it's important to note that once you file the patent application for an invention, that invention is no longer new because it's been disclosed to the public record. This is particularly important because a single mistake on a patent application can cause an application to be rejected. Thus, if an application has been rejected, you can't then file another application for the same invention unless you do so less than a year from when the first one was filed. And that's because that first application means it's no longer new. Generally, you can obtain a patent for the following types of things. Machines, processes, compositions of matter, species of plants, designs of useful inventions. There are three patent type applications you can pursue. Utility patents, which protect new or improved useful processes, inventions of machines, or compositions of matter. Utility patent applications are by far the most common patent type granted. Design patents protect the underlying design of manufactured goods. It's important to note that something eligible for design patent protection might also be eligible for trademark protection, which could be better since trademark protection lasts longer. Lastly, plant patents protect new and distinct varieties of plants. Keep in mind, you cannot get a plant patent for a discovery of an existing plant. Patents are very, very complex. There's a lot of room to make mistakes. And as we said earlier, a single mistake is fatal to an application forever. We cannot recommend strongly enough that you seek assistance in obtaining a patent from a patent attorney or a patent agent. To give you an idea, look at these actual design patent and utility patent applications. The design patent application on the left is for the design of an Apple laptop the utility patent to the right is for an aircraft. As you can see, both require precise drawings or renderings of the invention and require detailed explanations of each feature and how each of the features work together to make an invention function. Note that these are just the cover pages to multi-page applications. Because the process of preparing a patent application is so complex and tedious, the overall cost of obtaining a patent is significantly more expensive than obtaining trademark or copyright registration. With the assistance of an attorney, you can expect to pay anywhere from five to 10,000 for a patent, and this can easily be higher depending on the overall complexity, your geographical location, and the amount of experience the attorney has. Patents are granted generally for a 20-year term from the date of filing of application for protection. After the 20-year term expires, anybody is free to copy, produce, and sell the invention with no compensation to the former patent holder. It's time for another pop quiz. True or false? Patents are always the best way to protect a specific composition of matter such as a secret recipe. False. For example, a secret recipe might be protectable by a patent, but it is also likely eligible for trade secret protection. For a secret recipe that is very hard to reverse engineer or replicate, a trade secret would offer longer protection than a patent. That brings us to our fourth type of IP tool, trade secret. So what exactly is a trade secret? 
It's a type of protection obtained by taking reasonable measures to protect the secrecy of information and the characteristics of the information. The specific information or secret cannot be publicly known and must have economic value. Because it must remain a secret, no registration is needed. So, if information has to remain a secret, how can a business use the information or benefit from it? The answer to this is that simply keeping the secret to yourself is not the only way of maintaining secrecy. Businesses commonly use non-disclosure agreements to protect information from being released. An NDA is a contract that usually states the type of information to be shared between the parties in the agreement and what specific uses of the information are permissible. Employees, vendors, and any other third parties who need to know trade secret information should be required to sign an NDA. Some additional common tools to ensure secrecy include labeling confidential information as confidential and frequent employee training on the handling of confidential information. All of these procedures, when applicable, should be undertaken in some form or fashion to protect the secret. Trade secrets are protectable so long as the information is not publicly disclosed, appropriate security measures are in place, and the information retains economic value. The total costs of a trade secret protection are entirely dependent on the steps and measures implemented to maintain secrecy of information. However, Generally, you can expect to pay anywhere from $250 to $500 for a non-disclosure agreement prepared by an attorney. For more in-depth information on each of these tools, check out our other toolkits on our websites. You can also visit copyright.gov and uspto.gov. For more information about ASBTDC or the Business Innovations Clinic, please visit our respective websites at the addresses supplied on this slide. We hope that you have enjoyed this presentation.